Jesus is the best news around. I'm referring to the Jesus of living faith. Saints throughout the centuries attest to this. Saints well-known and saints barely known. It doesn't matter. They uniformly say that nothing compares to this living Jesus, leading, caring, comforting, challenging, empowering. Just take time to read their stories for yourself and you will see that what I am saying to you is true. Jesus is the best news around. And the evangelical stream centers on this great good news. Jesus is alive and here to teach his people himself. He has not contracted laryngitis. His voice is not hard to hear. His vocabulary is not difficult to understand. He is here now. He opens the way for us to walk into the life and powers of the kingdom of God here, now. All we need do is trust Jesus, trust him for everything, in everything, with everything. He is a living teacher. He will show us the way. If we trust that he will teach us, he will teach us now. Our world is hungry for the reality of the Jesus life. The Gospels have vast appeal because they brim with this Jesus life. And the Jesus who walked the dusty roads of Galilee rose from the dead and is among us here, now. He will be in us and he will guide us if we trust him. That is all. Trust him now. Well, witnesses to the evangelical stream abound. I'm going to focus on Priscilla and Aquila in the New Testament and on John Wesley in Christian history. This couple, Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla, they're so interesting. In the New Testament, their names are spoken both ways. Sometimes Priscilla's name comes first. Sometimes Aquila's name comes first. I mean, this is an astonishing fact, really, in first century patriarchal culture. Clearly, they were a team ministry of the first order. The Apostle Paul first met Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth. They were refugees from Rome. Jews had been expelled in A.D. 49 by an edict of Claudius, and so they fled to Corinth. Paul was on his second missionary journey. Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers by occupation, and Paul was too. And so Paul stayed with them there in Corinth, and they worked on their tent-making business together. And of course, Paul was preaching all over the place, and Aquila and Priscilla got in on this teaching from the greatest Christian teacher of the day. This went on for two years. Paul stayed in their home for two years. I mean, have you had any relatives like that? <laughs> Next, the three of them, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila travel together to Ephesus. And Paul takes his leave of them at that point and continues on to other places, visiting communities of faith he had established on his earlier journeys. So Priscilla and Aquila are there in Ephesus when along comes a bright new voice for the Christian cause, Apollos. Let me read that particular story to you. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Now, Apollos was from the great city of Alexandria, and from all accounts, he was exceedingly eloquent and well-versed in the scriptures, and he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. But his knowledge base was limited. His teaching only got him 
to the baptism of John the Baptist. That is, it was a gospel of repentance. And that is good as far as it goes. In fact, a lot of preaching and teaching today goes no further than a gospel of repentance. But there's more. There is life in the kingdom of God. Jesus is not just the Messiah of repentance, but the Messiah of life. And there is the baptism by the Holy Spirit and by fire. And so Aquila and Priscilla bring Apollos into this full-orbed gospel reality. Now Priscilla and Aquila were able to do this because they had for two years worked side by side with Paul in Corinth. They had heard the fullness of life in the kingdom of God and they were able to pass that on to Apollos. So they told him the rest of the story. Finally, the edict of Claudius was lifted in A.D. 54, and this allowed Aquila and Priscilla to return to Rome. They established a house church there, and we hear about this from Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul says, greet Persca and Aquila. Now, he used the name, the shortened name, Persca, I suppose a little like we might say Jim for James. Greet Persca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. This comment of Paul's that Priscilla and Aquila risk their necks for my life may refer to the riot that occurred in Ephesus or to some other event that we don't know about. And Paul's statement that all of the churches of the Gentiles give thanks for Priscilla and Aquila may well hint at the fact that they saved Paul's life at some point. And with him being the apostle to the Gentiles, the de Gentile churches were especially thankful for their ministry. We hear about Priscilla and Aquila one more time. This is from a letter Paul wrote to Timothy around A.D. 64, thereabouts. Timothy, by this time, was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And Paul says simply, Greet Persca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. So it looks by this time that they had moved back to Ephesus. Or it's possible that they had homes both in Rome and in Ephesus and shuttled back and forth. No one knows for sure. Some scholars have even speculated that Priscilla may have been the author of the book of Hebrews in our New Testament. Again, no one knows for sure. But we know this for sure. Here was a couple working and ministering together, a real team ministry. That was a shining example of the evangelical stream, speaking forth the evangel message of the living presence of Jesus to one and all. I commend them to you. I hasten on to John Wesley, a sterling example of the evangelical stream. He, along with his brother Charles, spawned the great Methodist movement. It's hard to overestimate the impact this movement had on 18th century England and through Francis Asbury and Thomas Coke and their army of itinerant evangelists, that influence spread like wildfire throughout the entire world. It really was astonishing. Wesley was born in Epworth, England, the 15th of 19 children. His father Samuel was a vicar in the Anglican church but he was extremely unpopular with his congregation, probably because of the rigidity of his religious life. It's suspected that his parishioners set fire to the rectory twice. <laughs> and it's during the second fire that John, who was five years old at this time, was left in the building. And when Susanna, his mother, recognized what happened, she screamed and the neighbors who had been manning a, a bucket brigade quickly uh, jumped up on each other's shoulders until they could snatch John out of the window just before the roof caved in. John himself later re referred to this 
and himself as a brand plucked from the burning. It was when Wesley went to Lincoln College, Oxford, that he really began to develop spiritually. John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, who was destined to become a great evangelist, and others, they established a small group which became known derisively as the Holy Club. They met for Bible study, communion, and prayer. And I've been to that little room at Lincoln College where they met, and it's genuinely moving to imagine them there, developing the early disciplines that would later propel them into one of the truly great mission movements in all Christian history. After Lincoln College, John and Charles sailed for the American colony of Georgia, where John was to serve as the pastor of the Savannah Parish and was a missionary to Native Americans. He really failed at both. He fell in love with one Sophia Hopke, who worked alongside him in his endeavors. John was 34, Sophia was 17. And John wrote in his journal that Sophia would come in for Greek studies at 5 a.m. And I might imagine that a little more than Greek studies was going on. <laughs> anyway, after struggling over the issue for some time, John finally told Sophia that he could not marry her. And the very next day, she became engaged to a gentleman, Mr. Williamson. In his journal, Wesley writes about him, Miss Sophia became engaged to Mr. Williamson, a person not remarkable for handsomeness, neither for greatness, neither for wit, nor knowledge, nor sense, and least of all, for religion. <laughs> Angry at himself and angry at her, John refused to serve Sophia Eucharist after she was married. And as a result, the chief magistrate, who happened to be Sophia's uncle, issued a warrant for John's arrest. Well, that ended the idealistic venture to the Americas. John felt himself a dismal failure, and he wrote in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Who will deliver me from this evil heart of unbelief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while there is no danger near. But let, let death look me in the face, and my spirit is troubled. Oh, who will deliver me? from this fear of death. Now that reference to his fear of death likely relates to an experience he had while he was sailing to America. A violent storm had arose in the middle of the Atlantic and Wesley cowered in terror, but he saw a group of Moravian brethren peacefully singing a hymn as the waves broke over the bow of the ship and flooded the deck where they stood. Well, he never forgot that calm, sturdy faith of those Moravians. And when he returned to England, he struck up a friendship with a Moravian leader, Peter Bowler. He spent considerable time with the Moravians, was deeply influenced by them. For 35 years, John had struggled under the guilt of a kind of works righteousness. And these Moravians pressed in upon him the centrality of sola fide, salvation by faith alone. Finally, on May 24, 1738, Wesley went to a Moravian meeting on Aldersgate Street. Someone was reading Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Wesley describes the event in his journal. About a quarter before nine, while someone was reading and describing the changes which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he has taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. One of the biggest obstacles John had to overcome in the early days was his fear of open-air preaching. 
He notes in his journal, I could scarcely reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields, of which George Whitfield set an example on Sunday. Having been all my life so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought the savings of souls almost a sin if it were not done in church. At four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little promontory in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people. Now this field preaching, as it was called, brought with it severe opposition from the Anglican clergy. Many of the parish churches uh, were closed to him. and They weren't used to a gospel preached in the highways and byways to whomever would listen. When Wesley was banned from preaching in his home church, where his father had served and died, he used his father's gravestone as a podium while preaching to the people gathered in the graveyard. And the vicar couldn't chase him off because the burial plot belonged to the Wesley family. Sometimes the Anglican clergy would pay drunks to break up Wesley's evangelistic meetings, but Wesley quickly learned to dress up his Methodists as drunks to infiltrate the crowd <laughs> so that they would speak well of Wesley and calm everyone down. Wesley himself learned to pick out the ringleader of any group and strike up a conversation with him, often turning his chief antagonist into his personal bodyguard. Wesley was criticized mercilessly for the crudeness of his field preaching. Not decent, not proper. One leading woman, the Duchess of Buckingham, wrote, Wesley's doctrines are most repulsive and strongly tinctured with impertinence in endeavoring to level all ranks and do away with all distinctions. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that claw the earth. <laughs> Wesley responded, I would observe every punctilio of order except when the salvation of souls is at stake. Then I prefer the end to the means. <laughs> well, this field preaching was exceedingly effective. I believe his largest crowd was at Cornwall, where he preached at a sinkhole, a kind of natural amphitheater, to 30,000 people. 30,000. As a follow-up to his evangelism efforts, Wesley developed a small group structure to help his new converts become intentional about growing in the spiritual life. These simple structures were quite ingenious. The societies for fellowship, the class meetings for a loving, nurturing accountability, the bands for mutual confession of sins, and the love feasts for celebration. It was because of these simple structures for spiritual growth, these methods, if you will, that they received the name Methodists. Wesley rode an estimated 250,000 miles on horseback during his lifetime. He preached 42,000 sermons. In other words, for Wesley, evangelism was a way of life. It was a lifelong process. Conversion was only the beginning. The goal was to live a holy life, to be, as he would put it, sanctified. He preached that a change in belief manifests itself in a change in behavior and preached against everything that was destructive to people. The societies, the class meetings, the bands, they were means of helping people be intentionable about changing their behavior with the help of the Holy Spirit. But evangelism was not Wesley's only passion. He effectively combined evangelism with social justice. These were inseparably intertwined for him. Scholars have suggested that the great good of Wesley's ministry and that of his circuit riders is the only thing that saved England from experiencing the same type of bloody revolution that rocked France in the late 18th century. I remember well the time I visited the Wesley House 
on the outskirts of London, across from Bunhill Fields Cemetery, where many of the famous dissenters are buried. The Wesley Chapel is next door. I was there where Wesley lived his last years, dying in the bedroom of his house. Wonderfully, there were no tourists the day that I visited. The caretaker of the premises unlocked the doors and allowed me to spend the day alone, uninterrupted. I first went into the chapel, sitting in the pews, standing in the pulpit where Mr. Wesley had often preached. I then went into the house, and I was there alone for perhaps three hours. I found the hidden drawer in the back side of Wesley's desk where he would keep the monies he had collected at the class meetings which were to be given to the poor. I stood for a long time in the bedroom where Wesley died. Off to the side was a tiny room, no larger than a walk-in closet. A small window at the end of the room let in the outside light. In front of the window, was only one piece of furniture, an old-fashioned Anglican kneeler. How many times had Mr. Wesley knelt there to pour out his heart to God? Quietly, reverently, I knelt at that prayer bench for the longest time, silent and still. Looking out of the window, I could observe the gravestone of John Wesley. Finally, I uttered one simple, passionate prayer. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful for these examples, Priscilla, Aquila, John Wesley, so many others. But we have to live today, now. Oh, how we ask that your kingdom come, that the great advancement of the gospel will go forward through our lives. People right here in this room, people watching by means of DVD. Oh, Lord, may great evangelists emerge and may simple people just going to their neighbors emerge and develop. Help us, Lord. Help me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dallas, what does it mean for a person to live a word-centered life? Well, at the risk of sacrificing subtleties, it simply means that we take the Bible uh -huh. and we spend time in it uh -huh. and we come to know it uh -huh. um, uh, and know what it teaches. And then, of course, it means that we actually center our whole life around what we find in the Scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's, there's no substituting for that simple uh, fact. Uh, we need our, our uh, lives, our minds, our feelings to be structured around the wordings mm -hmm. of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Primarily the wordings uh, that come in Jesus, but those who are leading up to him and those who are interpreting and building on him, uh, they were being taught too, and we need to have our minds occupied that. There, there, there's that way. There's a real choice for a human being. What shall I give my mind to? Mm. And in many ways, it's right to say this is our first freedom and our most basic freedom. Where do we choose to put our mind? Yeah. Yeah. And I think put them on the scriptures, and of course, the living word this is the center of the scriptures. So the center of the center is Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And to have a word centered life then is to come. Uh, to be focused on him and his words and to make them something that is running in us constantly. Yeah. And that's the secret of the Psalm 1 man again. Who right. Meditates right. in it day and night. Day and night. Can you just give us an example, if you would, uh, of how you do this? 
Well, um, of course, I have long periods of study of the Scripture. A part of that is vocational, mm -hmm. as with you and others. But that has not helped me as much as memorizing lengthy passages of Scripture. Huh. And there's something about that, like, say, the first part of Romans 8 or all of it, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, that comes together. And it's like taking in a substance or a passage that I often recommend to people on retreats. Uh, is to memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17, mm. which is perhaps the best packaged version of what the Christian life can be and should mm. be. Mm. Uh, and it's a wonderful teaching. And the thing is, when you, when you take this in you in this way, then it, it runs without you necessarily thinking about it. Mm. Uh, you take it into your mind, you take the word in, and it reorders your life. Uh, can you tell us what exactly the good news is? This yes. good, good news of the gospel. What yeah. is it? The good news is that we can now live in the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We put our trust in Him. He brings us into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is where what God wants done is done. Mm. And this is really very challenging to many people because they think the world is a bad place and nothing can be done really until we get out. Mm. And I like to say the world is a perfectly safe place for us to be if we're living in the kingdom of God. Mm. And that's the really good news. Or I like to say to people, if you want to go to heaven, go now. <laughs> right. Don't wait until right. later. Because heaven is here. <clears throat> it's at hand. Mm. And this is what we need to uh, proclaim to people. And that's the first step. It's just proclaiming it. Mm -hmm. We proclaim mm -hmm. the, the availability of the kingdom yeah, to absolutely. everyone, no matter what their status or abilities. Uh, that's available to yeah. them. And that is the good news. Ah. Uh, now, I, do, I like to just say it's just faith in Jesus because that's what... Right, to. right. But you need sometimes to unpack it a little, you don't do you? You do indeed, because there's a lot of versions of faith in Jesus that just don't get you there. They don't get you there. Mm.